strategic thinking and strategic action. I will explain in a moment uh, what I mean by this and not dwell on what we did in the first part of the seminar on the properties of strategic thinking, but what is required in order to teach people who are interested in studying it, either in universities, in an academic um, uh, environment, or when it comes to the military or people who are engaged in uh, decision making. And I want to speak about strategic thinking and strategic action, and the, and the question of how to teach people how to think strategically and how to act strategically, namely not just the people who are supposed to be helping the decision maker, but also what a decision maker needs to understand when he is operating in a strategic environment. And let me just following the last lecture, the fascinating lecture that, we, that we've heard here today, re-emphasize that I'm speaking about what many people call the grand strategy, namely not the relationship between the military action and the outcome or the desired outcome of a war, but looking at the broad national security context. Now, as I have already mentioned in the first lecture here, strategic thinking can be applied to many fields, but what I want to focus on today is teaching strategic thinking for people who are engaged in national security. And the key term you have to bring into this is the term of responsibility because very often people who need to take these decisions have a responsibility to their nation and sometimes in extreme cases even to the fate of humanity. So they need to see the broadest possible uh, picture so that they can finally make the decisions that will have an impact on the fate of their nations and as I said sometimes of, um, sometimes of humanity. And the key term is responsibility and you have to teach people to think responsibly, to act responsibly and to educate for uh, responsibility. To repeat something that I've already said here a few days ago, but since uh, some of the people were not here, let me just say strategic thinking is not for everybody. You can teach strategic thinking, but some people will naturally be inclined in it. Some people are wired to think strategically. Others have other properties that can be very, very important. They can have a, an attention to detail. They can have abilities, very good communicating abilities. And it's very important when you have to get legitimacy to uh, what you said. But this kind of thinking can be developed even among the very talented people who are inclined to it. And for others, you can educate, you can train, you can use experience, you can tell them about history, you should tell them about history and historical experience and hope that they will uh, learn to it, learn from it. But you, you need to go beyond the event, beyond the specific decision, beyond the specific choices, beyond the immediate outcome, and look, and here I find it very comfortable to use the term, at the große Zusammenhänge, namely at the broadest possible picture, first of all in terms of what it affects, the fields that it affects, and also in the depths of time, because the effect of a certain war or the effect of a certain political confrontation can be very, very lasting. To give only one example, most of what I understand of the history of the Western world in recent decades originates in the Great War in the, what we call now the First World War. And I think that once you understand what profound impact it can have for a very, very long time, then this context of the große Zusammenhang, the, the broadest possible context is absolutely, uh, is absolutely necessary. Now, you need, in addition to the people who make the decisions, you need a staff of people who can prepare the options for them. So even if you don't get the great genius, let me put it this way, you can teach everybody to play the piano. Perhaps I'm an exception, but I'm told everybody can learn to uh, uh, play the piano. But if you want to be a great musician, a great writer, a great, a great sportsman even, you need special talents. But these people need 
editors, they need coaches, they need people who will prepare the options for them. So when you're educating people, you're not just educating the decision makers themselves, you're also educating their staff. And it's important and it is worthwhile to invest, to invest into it. And when you are preparing them for this task, I think there are four things that they need to learn more than anything else. Let me list them, explain them, and then later say what you need, not, in order, not only in order to have strategic thinking, but also to use these components effectively when you come to your decision-making uh, position. First of all, you must start with showing them the broadest possible picture of what they must draw on when they prepare to take a major decision. It can be in war or in, or in another dramatic decision, but people are usually aware, and you can very easily make them aware and strengthen it, and it's necessary, about political components, military components, economic components, but there are so many other things, particularly in the modern world, that you must focus in that people are usually not aware of. Namely, the element of legitimacy, to give only one example, the soft elements. You cannot conduct an effective war, you cannot pursue an effective attempt to reach peace or to come to an understanding or create a coalition if you don't have the support of the people you can lead them for a while without them understanding exactly what you're doing because they trust you, but after a while you have to convince them that what you're doing is well embedded in their value system, that it is something that is legitimate, that it is something that they need to support because of what they are or what they want to be or what they want to be seen by themselves and by others. And without starting by telling them how many things can affect their decision, how many things can affect their ability to stick with a certain policy, you cannot start any other serious discussion. This is absolutely the beginning, to make them aware, and this is relatively easy. You don't have to be very talented, you don't have to be geared towards strategic thinking, you can simply take a very large checklist and tell them, here are the things that you need to consider that you didn't know that you need to consider, but you must consider, because otherwise you will lose a very important component of your calculus. And that's easy. And now we come to the second that, in my view, is the most elusive, the most difficult, and in the final analysis requires this elusive issue of leadership. Namely, if you have 15, 20, 500 important issues, select one or two, or at the maximum three, that are absolutely vital. This, in my view, is the most important part of strategic thinking. Namely, the understanding that when push comes to shove, you can never deal seriously with more than two or three issues, and you must understand and you must make a decision. And this is not an analytical decision in the sense that you only look at it and when you are very wise you find out. There is a lot of fingerspitzing you feel involved. There is a lot of inspiration, if you want, involved. When you decide what is vital and then you have to make the most important psychological decision. What is it that you're willing to give up concerning important considerations that will suffer when you focus only on the vital considerations? Because if you want to cover everything, you will cover nothing. If you don't understand that you must, and this is your responsibility, understand that there will be painful consequences on important issues when you do the right thing, if you cannot psychologically and analytically come to this decision, you have no business being a leader. Now, many people are leaders when they have no business being a leader. I'm not saying that everybody who is in a position of decision making does it. I'm only saying when we are educating people towards it, we need to tell them that this is what they will be confronting. 
they will be confronted with a need to give up very important things in order to get vitally important things. And to me, this is something that is the most difficult to teach. And speaking of a 25-year experience that I had with students, and many of them were already decision makers on an uh, intermediate level when I spoke to them, and many of them became, came to the top level later. This was the most important thing to, uh, to do, and the most difficult thing to get the understanding of, and very few are uh, capable of. This, the third element is the constant need to adjust to the changes in the strategic environment. Because what happens is you start a certain crisis, and again, it can be a war, it can be a political issue, it can be an economic issue, many um, different aspects of national security. You are faced with a challenge and say you are very good and you found a good answer to this challenge. And it worked. Here is the danger. It was good today. It can be not good tomorrow because the environment has changed. And it changed because you made the right decision very often. So you fall in love with your decision. Your decision gave the answer to the initial challenge but then the enemy, who's also an actor, responds by changing his approach, his strategy. And you need to adjust to the new reality, and you want to stick with what worked. And when it worked, you got very positive responses for it, and you fall in love with it, and you stick to it, and then you're in deep trouble. Let me give you an interesting military example to demonstrate it. In the Yom Kippur War, in the 1973 war, Israel was confronted with thousands of tanks rolling towards Israel. Immediately after the war, we developed a very good response for this challenge. And today, if the Egyptians one day want to make war and take thousands of tanks into the Sinai, they're welcome. It will be a feast from an Israeli point of view. But the Syrians, who understood that we have an answer for it, simply allowed their armor to rust. And they changed completely their strategy, focusing on small anti-tank units that were designed to hunt Israeli tanks and particularly designed to bring casualties to the Israeli army because they know this is what the Israelis are particularly sensitive to. So, Having the answer for the onslaught of hundreds of thousands of tanks is good and you should keep it and you should continue to develop it and it's a very good thing because you don't want it to come back. You don't want this challenge to come back. But realizing that because we did the right thing, the challenge changed and this can happen not only in the course of a decade, it can happen during a war, during a confrontation, is tremendously, uh, tremendously important. And last but not least, to look at the consequences, not in terms of the immediate outcome, but in terms of the long-range consequences of what you do. I'm playing a nasty game with my students when I speak to them, and most of them are very knowledgeable. My, most of my students are in their 40s and already having very serious responsibilities with great achievements. And when I um, challenge them in the beginning of the semester, I'm telling them, please tell me how do you judge the outcome of a war? What would be a good yardstick for the outcome of a war? And of course they will say the intuitive thing that is profoundly wrong. Namely, look at the objectives of the war. If the objectives of the war have been achieved, then the war was a positive, um, had a positive outcome, outcome in terms of the strategic uh, rationale. And if not, then of course we failed. You look at wars and you know we have a big sample in Israel. I've been personally involved in eight wars, so it's easy to study them. There's always another one and you can learn from many events in the past, not only as a historian but also with a, personal, with a personal involvement. 
I tell them, look at 1956. In 1956, we made a war, and the objective of the war, the real objective of the war, was to topple Nasser. This was the idea. And it failed. We failed completely. Primarily because Eisenhower made the British and the French fail, and this also meant that the Israelis failed. I will not go into it. But 1956 had an enormous impact on Israeli national uh, security because it convinced Nasser that he is too weak to undermine the existence of the State of Israel. And the next decade, between 57 and 67, Nasser, who was the only person who could have made war against Israel, spent most of his time in order to avoid war with Israel that the more radical Arabs tried to push him towards. By the way, finally he caved in, and in 1967 he, he made the war uh, inevitable. But for 10 years he did not try to do it. He tried to prevent the Syrians and other radicals from drawing him into the war because he realized he will fail in this particular war. So, did we succeed in toppling him? No. Was this the objective of the war? Yes, but did we succeed in convincing the most important Arab leader in the 1960s to try to avoid war? Yes, this is by far more important because in this decade, Israel became from a third world state to a state with a good foundation to be a first world state, and this is what counts. Take the other extreme. The 1982 war in Israel, in, in Lebanon, the first Lebanon war, was designed to kick the PLO out of Lebanon. Was the PLO kicked out of Lebanon? Yes. They boarded ships. You even had a picture where Arafat and all his men board ships and they sail to Tunisia. Great. We've achieved the objective of the war. But this war polarized the Israeli political system. Before and after this war, we had a political system in Israel where the overwhelming majority of Israelis are in the middle of the political spectrum with a relatively small left and a small right. And this is something that is tremendously important for the national security of Israel. For 20 years, as a result of the Lebanon war, we had a polarized system in Israel where you had two camps that considered themselves to be in a zero-sum game and from an Israeli point of view, this is a, a calamity. So don't look at the military objectives. Don't look at the immediate objectives. Look at the long-term objectives. These four elements, let me repeat them, incorporating in the preliminary strategic calculus the relevant considerations, then identifying the center of gravity and focusing almost exclusively on that, adjusting the to the changing strategic environment and considering the medium-term and long-term considerations. This in terms of the way people think strategically is the most important. Let me discuss now shortly what I would call responsible strategic action. And I'm referring here to the ethics of the behavior of a person who is in a position of making strategic decisions that affect the fate of his nation and sometimes, as I said, beyond that. And here is the one that is not difficult to convince decision makers after they've had a long experience to do because they do it almost naturally but it's very difficult to convince students when they come to learn about it and they haven't had a very big experience. Steer away from the truth. Truth is so valuable that you have to use it only in very extreme cases. Your responsibility as a decision maker is not to say something that is true, but to say something that is helpful. Leave it to the academics to speak about what is true because they have no responsibility and nobody takes them too seriously, I hope. But when you're the decision maker, the question is not if you say the right, the exact thing, the, the accurate thing, the true thing, but the helpful thing because you have a responsibility. You cannot indulge in your love of truth. You must say what helps your nation. Let me give you 
an example again from the Israeli experience. I had the, the privilege of knowing Ben-Gurion personally, so I've not only written a few books about him and studied uh, his, his affairs, but I could even discuss it with him. Ben-Gurion started, like most Zionist leaders in the 1920s, believing that if we come to the Arabs and we show them, we didn't come to replace you, we want to live alongside you. And we can help you become modern. You can learn from us how to have a much better future. And your children will have a much better future. He was a socialist. He really believed that the moment you offer people something that will improve the fate of their children and next generations, then they will say, oh, thank you for coming here, and thank you for willing to teach us all that, and we will be delighted to learn. And then he grew up like most socialists should and not all socialists do. Then he grew up. And then he was confronted with a completely different reality. And at the latest in 1929, he understood that an option of an agreement with the Arabs is impossible. And that a clash is inevitable because the Arabs will not accept the Jewish existence in this part of the world. And whereas he knew this to be true, and whereas other Zionist figures who did not have Ben-Gurion's responsibility also said it very openly, Ben-Gurion kept saying, we're on the verge of an agreement with the Arabs. This is what we need to do. Let's do it. Why did he do it? Why did he say it? Because the consequences of admitting to the reality as it was would have been catastrophic on two levels. First of all, in the 1920s and the 1930s, the Zionist endeavor depended, I would not say exclusively, but to a very, very, very large extent on British policy. And the Brits believed that the Jews and the Arabs can be brought together, and what they wanted, they didn't care how they will agree on it, they wanted both sides to be satisfied. And they were committed to a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. And Ben-Gurion understood that if you will make the British choose between the Jews and the Arabs, they will choose the Arabs. And the moment they realize you cannot reach an agreement, they will choose the Arab side, and then the Zionist endeavor can be terminated. And therefore, he didn't want them to choose, and therefore he wanted them to continue to believe that it is still possible. And therefore, he couldn't admit what he knew because the consequences would be catastrophic. By the way, in 1936-39, when the British understood it, they indeed had to make a choice. They made a choice. They made an anti-Zionist choice. They adopted an anti-Zionist policy in 1939. And it, is, it was only because the Second World War and the United States superseded Britain at the time that the British could not pursue this policy any longer because the Americans forced them in the final analysis to bring it to the United Nations, and the choice was not the British choice, and I'm not going uh, too deeply into the history of it. Would it be more intellectually satisfactory for Bulgarian to say the truth? Yes. Would it have been irresponsible in the worst possible sense that I can imagine? Yes, because his responsibility is not to say what is true. His responsibility is to do uh, what is helpful. Now, when you are constantly in a state where you are not reflecting reality, there are a number of dangers. A, one day you can start believing in what you tell everybody else. And I've seen it happening. People starting to speak about peace because they believe in it, because it's helpful, and then they believe in it without any reason whatsoever. And again, I had the opportunity of speaking to these people and it is fascinating to realize that they live in some kind of dissonance between what they know to be untrue and be between something that they started believing in. And of course, once you say it, you become committed to it publicly. And it becomes more and more difficult to distance yourself from it. And it becomes more and more difficult to do not what you said. And we have a, particularly problem, a particular problem in the age of transparency. I consider transparency 
to be very, very dangerous and particularly dangerous to democracy. Because once you're transparent, when people discuss something, they don't speak to the subject, they speak to the protocol. And then you can't have a serious discussion because people do not bring up what they believe to be correct. And here I mean in inner circles. Publicly, say whatever is helpful. But if that makes it impossible for you privately to discuss serious business without, you know, there is this uh, saying, um, I believe it, um, Queen, uh, this was said to, I think, the Israeli uh, by uh, the Queen about I forgot who, but we have here the British historian who will immediately remind me. He speaks to me as if I were a public meeting. You have the need to discuss issues in a way that brings in the considerations you really believe are the most important. And when you know that whatever you say today will be published tomorrow, you will just say what sounds good instead of saying what you think is right. And the danger of this conduct, and I'm trying to persuade people to adopt this conduct because the advantages are much greater than the shortcomings. But the shortcomings are very considerable. And when you consider a specific statement to the public, a specific message that you're sending the public, consider also these shortcomings, particularly in the age of uh, transparency. Another thing that is very difficult is to look at the war at hand in a broader context of avoiding the next war. Now, this is something that particularly in Israel we must do because every sensible Israeli understands that peace in the Middle East is not an option. Because if you look at it from an Israeli point of view, you see how Arabs treat each other and you ask yourself, is it possible that the Arabs will treat the Jews better than they treat their own brothers who speak the same language, who have the same religion, who have very often the same political objectives. You look at the region that is extremely violent and you realize that every war is only one link in a long chain of wars that you either can deter or you can prevent. Some of them you can prevent by political means, most of them you cannot, and you have to prepare yourself for a long series of confrontations. And then, when you conduct a specific war, it is very important for you to consider not what is the best th thing I need to do in order to win this particular war, but what will the legacy of this war be in the eyes of my enemies or of my potential enemies so that they can either postpone or even prevent the next war by deterrence. And then sometimes, and admittedly in extreme cases, you must come to the conclusion that winning the present war is not your number one priority because the impact on the overall national interest of Israel of winning a particular war can be harmful. Now, I alluded to it already on Monday, but let, let me repeat it here in this context because I think it is tremendously important. In 1973, in the Yom Kippur War, Israel could have destroyed the Egyptian armed forces. We had a third of them under encirclement. They didn't have water. They didn't have ammunition. They would be in a position where they could either uh, die of, of thirst or capitulate, but certainly not do anything. You could contain them very, very easily. They were not an effective fighting force. And then you could use the whole force of the Israeli army to deal with the other parts of the Egyptian armed forces, and you could have brought about a very clear victory that would have humiliated Egypt. But at the end of the war, the decision that Golda Meir made between the 22nd and the 24th of October 1973, influenced very strongly by Henry Kissinger, was, what do you want? 
do you want to win this battle or do you want to take Egypt out of the war? If you don't do what you can do, will you, by doing that, make it possible for Egypt to move from Soviet orientation to American orientation? And if they move to American orientation, the chances that Egypt will continue to make wars against Israel will be reduced dramatically, which is a good thing in itself. I mean, no war with Egypt, the most important Arab enemy of Israel. But here is another element. The rest of the Arab world has a lot of radical forces, and you will have other wars. Don't you want the Egyptians to be out of them so that you can deter them much better, and if necessary, win them much more easily? But it is counterintuitive to come to a military commander and even to a political head of state and to tell him, you are at war, if you don't win very decisively, it will undermine your even position in history. And it will certainly undermine your political position. But don't pursue winning this particular war because there are bigger fish to fry. I mean, these are the sardines. We are speaking about the Leviathan. We are speaking about the big picture, the Große, the Große Zusammenhänge. Very, very, um, very, very difficult to do. Uh, two more elements, much less important than the first two that I mentioned so far, but let me mention them. Uh, let me mention them anyhow. You need to convince people that will be in position of decision making to be almost paranoid. Because in the political situation in democracies today, if you say what you want and then it doesn't happen, you lost your political position and somebody will replace you who is less responsible than you are. So for instance, we have this model and it looks great on paper and academics can enjoy it where the government makes a decision, it comes to the army, it says to the army, do this, don't do that, I'm giving you this instruction and this instruction. Let me tell you how it really works because I know it from the inside of the Israeli system. The Israeli army is begging the prime minister to tell the chief of staff what the prime minister wants or what the government, the, in Israel, the uh, supreme commander of the armed forces is the government, not the prime minister, not the minister of defense, not even the cabinet, but the whole government. But at a certain point, the government will give the prime minister a very wide authority. And then the chief of staff, in Israel, the chief of staff is the commander of the armed forces, the military commander of all the armed forces, comes to the prime minister and says to him, what do you want me to do? And not using these words, the prime minister says, guess. Because he doesn't want to commit himself. Because if he says something that later will not be achieved, then they will say the prime minister failed. And therefore, he leaves it very, very open. But if the chief of staff doesn't understand what the prime minister wants to tell him, he will very, very delicately explain it to him, but never put it in terms that you can really then teach in a course of people who love things to be presented as if they're streamlined and very simple, but in terms that are always ambiguous, perhaps less ambiguous than the first step, but if the ambiguity doesn't help, then you can be a little bit less ambiguous, but you will not come to, a point of, uh, uh, come to a point of clarity. So first, wait for reality to show what happened, and then recreate the story of what you did about it. Okay? It's very difficult, but, um, but, but, but it can be done. Last but not least, something very interesting and if somebody's interested later, we can go into it because I've seen it happening so often. You need to exhibit a lot of determination and a lot of patience because if you're trying to do the right thing, it will be very difficult to explain what you're doing. Let me give you the best example. 
the foundation of a, an ex, a, a successful, a potentially successful national security policy is primarily deterrence. So when your enemy does something that you don't want him to do, you take action so that he will be persuaded not to do it because he is persuaded that he cannot take the consequences of this action. And now you do it, and your enemy does what he did before, only much more of it. And what is his objective? His objective is to convince you that what actually works doesn't work. So you have to say to yourself, and that's very difficult to explain even in your inner circle, let alone when you come to the public, because the action failed, it is the right thing to do. Because it failed in the short run, it is the right, right thing in the long run. Because the reason he is increasing his aggressive action against me is to persuade me to abandon this that he is more afraid of than anything else. And therefore, he wants to convince me that it doesn't work. So we need to do more of what in the short run did not work. And that's extremely difficult, but you must do it if you want to pursue a, a policy that is um, effective. One last point about the teaching itself. There are two kinds of students that you face and with both, you have a problem, but a very different problem. You either have young students with little knowledge and little experience, people who have not been through the trauma of war and haven't been through, and that's even more important, the trauma of getting the wrong results by not acting wisely on the uh, strategical level. And also, they have a fantasy about human beings being rational. In other words, they behave, they believe that human behavior is determined primarily by rational considerations. And it's very difficult to educate them because they need to grow up before you can educate them. And then you have the other extreme, and I have a lot of this, um, very experienced students in senior positions in their mid 40s that are very, very good at what they do and they're good at what they do and they believe that what they do is strategic. It isn't, but they believe it is. They're operative in their deeds and in their thinking, but they believe themselves to be strategic and they're very, very good at it and they think that they know how to act strategically. And with them, it is very difficult. It works in the final analysis, and the only way it works is to bring a lot of historic examples where the kind of decisions that they want to promote were used, and it led to failure. Now, as we heard here in the previous lecture, and I very strongly agree with the message of the previous lecture, the fact that something didn't work in the past doesn't mean that it will not work in the future and things don't repeat and so on. But if a certain approach systematically did not work and you can show that the circumstances on the relevant issues did not change, then it needs to bring you to consider the possibility that that's not a good policy. And people who are very clever and very intelligent and very experienced are often not wise. And when it comes to the kind of strategy, to this kind of grand strategy, it is wisdom, not intelligence, not even knowledge. You need to see things from a perspective that is different. And to educate people to do it is, um, is not easy, but it can be done. Let me end with one comment. I hope that what I said, particularly concerning the ethics of, um, uh, of uh, strategic action, will cause some of you, this is really my deep hope, to brand me as Machiavellian. This would be the greatest compliment that I can possibly think of, and please, would someone say that I'm Machiavellian, I will feel very, very good about myself, even better than I do anyway. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Professor, giving us the Israeli experience, the special Israeli view to this particular topic, how to teach strategic thinking. Now my question to the audience is, uh, do we have some question to the professor, please? Yes, General. Thank you for these uh, excellent insights. Uh, in, in the four stages of, of strategic thinking, narrowing down to the vital thing, as you call it, seems to me a very difficult exercise. So do you have some proposals or techniques? Of what is the essence of this narrowing down? Can I yes, yes, yes. Not techniques, but the one important principle, and this is look at the whole society. Again, let me say something about the experience of Israel because it is very extreme. We are at war for 140 years, and Israelis. <coughs> recently, and I'm delighted that this happened in Israel, realize that the next 140 years will not bring us peace, love, and brotherhood. You live in a region where this is not exactly an option. Can you and should you reach peace with uh, your Arab neighbors? Yes. Every time you will reach peace, there will be a more radical element. The technology today makes it possible even to small groups to go to a supermarket and uh, buy things that will make it possible for them to have a rocket that goes in the middle of your cities and there is a limit to what you can uh, defend against it and so on. And the one thing that counts more than anything else is the resilience of the Israeli people. And the resilience is enormous. It is beyond my wildest dreams concerning the willingness of Israelis to say, you know, that we're not sure if the next war will come in two hours, two weeks, two years, four years, if it will come from the north or it will come from the south. But Israelis have adopted an attitude towards their environment that is similar to the attitude of people who live in California and live on the Santa Andreas Fault. You know, earthquakes will come. In Oklahoma, twisters will come. In the Middle East, wars will come. Be now, if the Middle East changes and suddenly Mother Teresa becomes the president of Iraq, then perhaps we can reconsider. But at the moment, if you look at the Middle East for the next generation, how people are educated today, that's a given. So the resilience of the Israeli people should be your supreme concern. And let me give a personal um, experience at it. I tried to convince and, mainly, and finally managed to convince Ariel Sharon to unilaterally withdraw from the Gaza Strip. And at the time, people told me Will it not bring more terrorism? And I said, yes. Will it make it easier for Hamas to take over? I said, yes. So why do you want to do something that will cause more uh, confrontations or the confrontations will be more dangerous to Israel because in Gaza they can produce rockets independently because Israel is not present inside Gaza. And I'm advocating something similar about the West Bank different but similar in terms of unilateralism getting out. And my answer was very simple. Under what circumstances is the Israeli society stronger? With Gaza or without Gaza? My very clear answer was without Gaza the Israeli society is stronger for the next 140 years. <coughs> so I'm not looking at how many Israelis will be killed. And if somebody comes and tells me you will have 300 Israelis killed when you're in Gaza and 500 Israelis killed if you're outside Gaza. And I need to say, which is very difficult even for me, certainly if I were a decision maker or if somebody would have taken me seriously on the public level, to say, okay, 200 more Israelis will be killed. But I'm saying to myself, the focus is on the strengths of the Israeli society. 
and an Israeli society that understands that even if you withdraw from Gaza 100%, and even if they have an opportunity to develop greatly with enormous assistance from the outside, what they want is to focus on killing Israelis. If Israelis understand that, I have a stronger Israeli society. And Israel can give up almost anything except having a strong society. Even if American assistance to Israel goes down sharply, we can live with it. But if the Israeli society becomes more resi less resilient, we can't. So these kinds of considerations always start with your society would be the uh, principle that I would employ. Do we have some more questions? Yes, please. please. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Do moral aspects um, play a role when you formulate the grand strategy for your country? Yes. In a very, very, very major way. But the question is how you interpret it. If you interpret um, moral standards in the European way, Israel would have been destroyed if we would have accepted it. And if you determine it in the right way, then you can, um, you can explain it. For instance, there is a very important element of proportionality. Namely, if you are challenged on a certain level, when you respond, be more or less in this area in the way you respond. I very strongly agree with it. The question is, how do you measure it? If you're a European, you say, if you were attacked with a knife, respond with a knife. If you were attacked with two bullets, respond with two. OK, three bullets. When somebody attacks me with a knife and I have a gun, I'll shoot him. Otherwise, I'll be a European. OK? And by the way, the, the, the moment you are faced here with this situation, you shoot them too. If a, a terrorist organization threatens me, I will use drones. But then the socialists will come in, in Germany, and they will say, oh, no, drones, it's unfair. I mean, we have no skin in the game. It's unfair. So they live in La La Land, OK? And when they come to Israel with La La Land, or let me put it this way, if we would have listened to the Europeans, Saddam Hussein would have had nuclear weapons, Assad would have had nuclear weapons, and terrorists would control Tel Aviv. But we would be nice, because we wouldn't do what the Europeans told us is disproportionate. There is a proportionality. It is tremendously important, but let me tell you what the proportionality is. The Arab environment lives in what I would call something like 30 or 40 percent violence domestically, in their own families, in their own states, in their own societies. When they challenge us with 30 percent violence, and we will respond to them with 30 percent violence, they won't even notice that we responded. Okay? When it is like you take a thug from the street and he comes to a pianist and he breaks his fingers. So what would you say? Break his fingers? No because all he needs his fingers is to poke his nose, okay? There's a difference from the fingers of the pianist. What you get here is a situation, and it doesn't sound good, and if it doesn't sound good, it's probably correct. Most of what doesn't sound good is correct, okay? Or let me put it in a different way, more accurate. Most of what sounds good is incorrect. And here, what you have is the Israelis saying the following, and this is proportionality, and this is morality. They're doing to us something that we cannot live with. We must do to them something that they cannot live with so that they, they will stop doing to us what we cannot live with. And then if they leave us alone, we will leave them alone. And the only thing we want from them is to leave us alone. So is it moral? Yes. Have I convinced the Israeli public? Yes. Have I convinced the Americans usually? Yes. Have I convinced Europe? No. OK. <laughs> okay? Not very, uh, not very crucial. And yet, in terms of collateral damage, Israel has the best history ever in human history. Ever in human history. 
So, are we perfect? No. Do we make mistakes? Yes. Do we commit crimes sometimes? Yes. Believe it or not, we're human. But do the Israelis, and again, I'm coming back to the Israeli society, do the Israeli society, do, does the Israeli society give the army the license to do it? Morally, yes. Are the standards very high? Yes. This is the core, and this is what is important. Fine. The last question before the break, please, Dr. Rope. Thank you. Uh, I, I was wondering um, why you are labeling yourself a Machiavellist, because uh, although you are proud of it, there are two Machiavellists. One is a defender of the Republic, and the other who uh, applies rules for any purpose. And for example, even Hitler called himself a Machiavellist. So I would like to differentiate between these two Machiavellists. If you relate it to the to democracy and Republic of Israel, yes but uh, I'm not sure whether it could be related to any policy. Second, I would like to give an example. I think that we have in the US a very powerful discourse of avoiding a situation which led to World War II. So this would mean um, an arms race, power politics, and so on. But in my view, the, uh, if this might be right against the new Stalin or the Hitler or whatsoever, it might repeat exactly the situation with World War I. And in my view, poor power politics led to World War I. And therefore, I'm not sure whether we are really in a situation in, to, in which poor power politics would lead to avoidance of a new World War. Well, first of all, world war is not on, on the table. It used to be during the Cold War, but from, from, the, in the, from the Middle East, I don't think a world war can emanate today. It could in 1973, but it, it cannot today, I think. Second, I am always against bad policies and for good policies, which is very surprising, right? Of course you need, when you use power, not every use of power is legitimate. Actually, your two questions are the same question. Can you use principles for good purposes or bad purposes? I can use a knife for cutting um, a, a cucumber and I can use it for killing a person and it's still a knife. What I'm telling people, if you want a knife, have a sharp knife, okay? It will help you uh, cutting cucumbers and uh, I know that it will al also help you killing people. But I'm starting from the assumption that I'm here to cut new, uh, cucumbers and to make a salad, okay? Of course that what I would say about the concept of, uh, concepts that are usually associated with Machiavelli was look at the relationship between means and ends. If you want to achieve a successful policy, do A, B, and C. And then you have a discussion, what is a successful or what is a desirable or what is a morally supportable policy. And by the way, this is 90% of the Israeli discourse inside Israel, and I'm delighted it is so. And by the way, it is changing. What was acceptable in the, in the 40s and the 50s is, I'm delighted to say, not acceptable today. So this, these are two very separate elements. I'm speaking about the instruments. If we would have had a discussion here about policies, what is justified, what is unjustified, it's a different um, discussion. Here we were speaking about what is the necessary intellectual, analytical instrument in order to make a policy succeed. Fine. Thank you very much, Professor, giving us the Israeli point of view to the uh, uh, how to teach strategic thinking, especially to those people who are engaged in national security. Thank you very much. We will have now 15 minutes break and then we will start with the next panel. Uh, last point, uh, uh, good morning to our... Uh, uh, yeah, fine, good morning. So please have a break. Thank you very much. <laughs>